thank you to e publishers and netbank to to host this event which which of course is a very topical issue um, in the south african space at the moment not only about gas energy but certainly about uh, energy at large i think the perspectives that we would like to share with you today is is sort of my my song will be in minor tone all right <laughs> um, so keep that in mind but i think the the we would like to just share with you what we we are concerned about as industrial gas users in South Africa. Now, <coughs> the association is a formal non-profit association of uh, large industrial gas users. Um, and they, their main concerns are around, or objectives are to ensure the efficient uh, availability of hydrocarbon gas in South Africa, certainly to meet the growing demand for gas and energy at large. Focus areas, gas availability is key at the moment, and you'll see later on why. Um, gas policy, of course, is, is closely linked to that in the South African context, and then gas pricing. Uh, those are the three sort of key key areas that uh, the group is focused on. So our large gas users and members at the moment, um, it's a growing space purely because it's becoming more and more topical, but these are the large companies. There are various uh, uh, categories of membership, but um, it's largely driven, the policy and strategy of this association is driven by gas users. Um, per se. Then <coughs> the stakes are high in this industry. Um, these gas users contribute about 150 billion rand per annum uh, in terms of economic activity or revenue, employment over and above 46,000 people. <coughs> Combined at the moment 50 million gigajoules third party. This excludes the Sassel petrochemical and uh, 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 plant uh, consumption at the moment, but the demand certainly is much more than this at present. Of course, there are downstream implications. There's other large industries, small, medium enterprises as well, that utilize gas, but uh, entities, households, dependent on gas at the moment is pr probably in the region of about 8,000 uh, uh, institutions or dependencies, if, if, if you can say. So <coughs> I think the I would just like to sketch a little bit the, the, the context of our, of our message today. I think the, develop the development of the gas, gas economy in South Africa can be sort of put into four, four spaces. Certainly, let's start with the first one, 1998 uh, to 2005. The white paper on energy was, uh, was published and gas was, was sort of recognized as a, as a part of the energy mix going forward. Very important was the Gas Act in 2001, which certainly provided the regulatory space for the development of the gas economy in South Africa. And then from there on, the uh, development of the, let's call it the import infrastructure and distribution, transmission and distribution infrastructure that we have in South Africa today. I think the second period is very important because at this point, this is where gas usage started to, to, to sort of mature in our, in our daily lives and in the manufacturing space and the petrochemical space certainly. And uh, as, as industry started to adopt gas energy as an as a, as a energy alternative. So <coughs> it also found a place in, in government policy. Um, of course, shale gas was, was the potential was reported in the late 2000s um, by the um, American uh, Energy Intelligence Agency. And of course, the discoveries around uh, Mozambique and Tanzania opened up the potential for regional trade uh, also during this period. Of course, we're all aware of the electricity blackouts and the energy or electricity shortages that came about in 2008 and Eskom uh, turning to costly uh, uh, diesel uh, generation to, to supplement the energy shortfall. The next period, very exciting globally, less so I think in the South African context, but um, the global LNG sort of market started to really mature and develop and um, the ability to move gas and energy around quite cost efficiently around the world certainly took, uh, took a hold. Mozambique LNG took off with the Revuma development. It's estimated that uh, $128 billion <coughs> would be invested by 2029 in, uh, in the uh, LNG Revuma area. Gas price changes, very importantly, from long-term contracts. I think uh, John also touched on that, uh, to more short-term spot contracts, and that, that opened the market uh, for, for buyers and obviously started to, to, to result in a downward pricing trend. I think from a South African perspective, various programs around gas was announced from around 2012 uh, for gas in the energy mix. 
the GUMP was mooted, uh, Gas Utilization Master Plan, but the South African state was not to act nor execute on, on, on any of these policies soon due to the focus on nuclear at that stage. So we entered a period of stagnation in the development of the gas economy and the downscaling of international gas majors' presence in South Africa. So on the back of the shale sort of found lots of companies, uh, uh, global companies uh, established in South Africa with that potential, but they've subsequently downscaled their, their interest in South Africa. So <coughs> right now, this is the fourth period that we're entering. We are, and, and this, this certainly resonates with the electricity position that we're in. It's, uh, there's a gas energy shortage. And remember, this is not about gas to power. This is about direct heating or industrial type uh, uh, applications of gas. So we also have a limited, limited gas pipeline infrastructure in South Africa or gas receiving infrastructure. There's no LNG receiving infrastructure at present. And uh, there's significant increases in the gas cost for, for industrial users also playing out. And we foresee that coming, coming on board as well. Um, in the years to come. So policy cert uncertainty as to the future role of gas in SA's energy mix and the timing thereof, that's uh, becoming critical and I'll demonstrate to you later on exactly why timing is, is, is certainly of the essence. So we're finding ourselves today, the reality is that we, we, we're in a position that, that says uh, gas energy uh, insecurity um, amidst the dwindling sasol gas supply. Uh, the resource that they that uh, that we find uh, that we're finding our gas from at the moment, Banet Tamani has a, has a certain finite life. So very important. So I think <coughs> just talking about gas availability and, and how to move forward from this. This is typically the landscape uh, of what we have, and, and I'll just take you through a little bit of a tour of how industry sees um, sees the gas landscape at the moment. We, yeah, sadly, we, 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 uh, we call it the uh, Great Gas Disappearing Act, and you'll see now why uh, we, we, we term it like that. But I think <coughs> you have to see this comments, these comments we make in the context of uh, industrial gas usage, the requirement for, obviously, electricity or more gas uh, to generate uh, electricity and, and apply energy, gas energy elsewhere in our processes. But you also need to got to s you, you, you have to see these comments also around about s a, a finite time period, which is around about 23, 24, which is about four or five years from now. So please, with those lenses, just, just, uh, just bear me out. So <coughs> starting with Kudu, uh, Kudu was discovered in 1974. It's a relatively small, small find, uh, 1.3 TCF, and it's anchored on gas to power exports that is currently not materializing for, for, for Namibia. There's technically long uh, subsea tie-ins, which makes it difficult and expensive to, to, to exploit. And of course, the economic feasibility and the development for this, uh, for this gas resource remains unclear at this point. So we can take it off the board for now. Petro SA Block 2, I think that's, uh, that's been discovered yeah, in, in 1987, more or less the same size. Petro SA, I think, has got a 24% stake, if I'm not mistaken. But the economic feasibility is unclear, and the development, in our view, is unlikely, purely because if this eventual exploitation will have to compete with global LNG markets. And the, 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 um, given the, the, the volume constraints of this particular um, deposit or resource, it, it, it remains questionable. So for now, I think we can take that off the board as well. Blocks. 9 and 11, uh, I think it was John that mentioned earlier, or um, yeah, I think it was John that mentioned that uh, it's basically at the end of its life. The, uh, it's the main feedstock for the MOS gas plant since 1992. It's virtually depleted. Um, uh, MOS gas is operating below capacity in order to balance the, the, the lifespan, obviously, of the, of the uh, feedstock. And um, Petro SA also owns the um, Block 11 adjacent, small 590 million gigajoules but it's unlikely to be developed anytime soon. Brillpada, very exciting found, of course. Total Qatar Petroleum involved. Um, they have announced significant gas condensate prospect early in the year. It's in the Otuniqua Basin, very deep, um, but it's in a very early exploration phase. And uh, we don't think that anything will come off this 
for the benefit of South African consumption, particularly in the next 10-year window. So for all practical intents and purposes, I think, again, if you, if you consider the timeline of around about 23, 24, we can certainly um, take this off the board as well. Karoo shale gas, a lot have been said and spoken about Karoo shale gas. I don't want to dwell on this, but um, the economic feasibility and the actual size of the deposit remains uncertain. Shell has made certain statements about two years ago around the likelihood of this being, being uh, developed, um, uh, not, not, not being too positive. Um, but even if you do start today, uh, it will certainly take you about 10, 15 years to exploit and develop that resource for domestic consumption, purely because of the vast amount of infrastructure that is required in a very spares, uh, spares area of South Africa, water infrastructure, supply chain infrastructures, etc. around that. So again, I think it's important very long term, but certainly not relevant uh, for us in the next five to ten years. Mamba Laseri, not to dwell on it too much, it's relatively small. Um, yes, I think there's a lot of underlying gas um, in, in, in the coal bed methane um, uh, reserves of Botswana. Uh, there's been recent announcements of uh, steady gas flow from, from a particular uh, concession, and uh, this, is, this is likely to be anchored on a small localized uh, gas to power facility. For now, I think, given the size and where they are, we can certainly ignore that as well. The Virginia, a very, very interesting project. Um, our understanding of this is that uh, there's, there's gas available. Of course, um, uh, um, underlying that is, is, is the vast helium resources uh, associated with that. Um, this is probably going to be the first uh, d uh, commercially sort of uh, uh, LNG facility in South Africa. Although the market focus is different, it is uh, our understanding at least is that the economics certainly uh, point towards the displacement of liquid fuels um, in South Africa or in the region around Gauteng, and um, it is not necessarily for domestic consumption. Also, given the size of the deposit, um, it, it, it will only serve as a, as a supplementary or a very tiny bit of, 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 of our gas demand. So we can take that off. I think Revuma, of course, is very important. We've touched on that. I think all of us have sort of uh, uh, referred to that. But I think <coughs> a lot have been said about the particular pipeline. This pipeline here, um, what is the potential to link in this pipeline into South Africa? Of course, anything is possible, but at a price. Um, it requires about 1,700 kilometers of pipeline coming into into the Romco, which would be a natural connection point, which is the existing pipeline uh, or infrastructure that we have in South Africa. Um, the issue here is scale. Um, for this to happen, we need a consumption base of about 400 million gigajoules. South Africa on its own consumes about half of that at the moment. So how do you bridge that gap from a feasibility perspective? That is the big question. Even if it does start today, you would probably look at about 10 years uh, in terms of the development of that pipeline and possibility. So for now, Revuma, um, although important, and I think long term, uh, it is certainly a focus for, for South African gas users because piped gas, in our view, uh, cross-border, or hopefully even uh, domestically, will certainly yield the lowest cost uh, for, for, for gas consumers. So for now, in terms of our timeline again, we can ignore Revuma. Zambezi Angosh, I think this is probably the most economical long-term potential that we see right now. Um, it, is, it is about roughly the size of uh, the Pandit Tamani Fines, about 3 to 5 TCF, uh, but it's still very early in its exploration period. Um, but it's an important one to keep on your radar because the developments in that obviously require a very smaller link into a pipeline, uh, into the Romco pipeline at least, as you can see there. So certainly a long-term target for, for economically or gas pricing-wise for, uh, for South African consumers. So, but again, this is, this is definitely a long-term uh, prospect, but we are currently focused on Bande Tamani. Now, <coughs> I'm not going to go into the history of Bandi and Tamani or the volumes, but the key point here is that gas from this facility will reduce by about 7.5% from 2023. 
And this is core to the industrial position that, that we have today. From that point onwards, it is likely that gas will be reduced by about 15% per annum as the supplier gets to the end of the, the life of that particular resource. SASL, which is obviously owning and operating this facility, has two mitigating projects. The one is the compression and infilling project, and the other one is a project under the, um, the um, PSA agreement that they have with the Mozambican government. So, and I'll get to the graphic now because that summarizes the story quite well, but the um, SASL will probably reach FID, hopefully, on the CIP portion of the project, the compression and infilling project, by about 2020, mid-2020, mid uh, estimated at about a cost of $500 million. The PSA, or the Production Sharing Agreement, um, would give us about, um, uh, yeah, a gas availability there, certainly linked to, I think, a gas-to-power plant. Um, it remains questionable what is gonna come out of that particular space. So, very briefly, is this is what the position looks like for industrial gas in South Africa today. And this also is the position that SASL is faced with today. So gas, as we use it today, is roughly about 190 million gigajoules, but given those percentages, it's likely to taper off. Adding to that, SASL's two projects that we've said, the one is the um, infilling and compression project, the other one is the uh, uh, production sharing, the, let's call it the, the additional exploration project, will simply buy us a little bit of time, hopefully, out of that project. So these are the critical time periods that we faced with before we start running out of gas in this country. What needs to be done? We have to find an alternative project starting next year in order to supplement not only the gas shortfall, potential shortfall, which is very real at this stage, but also to give us gas for um, our increased demand on that particular point. So where does it leave us? LNG imports, I think, very important. We will have to import a lot of gas, right? If you take that gap and if it materializes, we have to add the growth demand in that as well. Kuche, as you can see, within the framework of 2024, the, the, time, the time stress that we're under is of little consequence to industrial gas usage currently. Saldana certainly not to be ignored. It's very important, but um, exactly for the same reason for Kuche, it is it is of no consequence um, for industrial gas usage in South Africa. So the only options that we foresee right now is LNG through Maputo or LNG through Richards Bay. Now, <coughs> just very briefly, I'm, 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 on the, I'm on the pillar here, but um, just on the Richards Bay LNG imports, of course, we're all aware of the Transnet, uh, the Transnet project, uh, potentially looking at downstream distribution models, pipeline and or rail distribution for gas. It's in the uh, early pre-feasibility stages. Um, yeah, the investment uh, number is still out there, I think. The uh, feasibility of this and the readiness for this around, around 24, 25 is certainly unconfirmed at this point. But it could potentially benefit KZN and inland users by bringing in an additional 20 million gigajoules, um, but also an additional 20 million gigajoules for the methane-rich gas that's currently flying, uh, uh, flowing south. Uh, to, to Richards Bay. Just briefly, brief comments on the Maputo project. It's recently been announced by the government of Mozambique. <coughs> uh, it's a private sector development. There are two concessions. The one is for the unlimited import of LNG, and the other one is for the unlimited power selling uh, to about 2,000 megawatt. So it allows for the placement of the FSRU in the port of Mozambique, a relatively short pipeline linked to the power station that is being uh, planned or intended, and then another 90 kilometer link into, into the Romco. Then you're already there. Potential readiness around this is around about 2022. So the minimum volume for this to make it happen is about 50 million gigajoules, which is not a lot considering the potential shortfall that we have, and notwithstanding the, the demand for gas that we have over and above what is being supplied. 
So what this could happen without any, without any benefit to, um, or without any further investment in, in uh, pipeline infrastructure, it could increase, it can obviously service the demand, the current demand, but it could bring about another 7 million gigajoules into the KZN area, and certainly another 16 million gigajoules into the existing ROM ROMCO. So it could certainly assist with the, with the in increased demand for uh, uh, gas to a certain degree. So key considerations, what is our reality today? I think we're already in a gas energy crunch. certainly resonates with what we had with electricity 10 years ago. No entity right now has concrete plans to meet our, our uh, gas energy challenge in time. The state through various entities and legislation is certainly in control of the energy and the gas economy. The state has no policy on development of, gas in of, of the gas economy, but I would like to add yet. I know there's some, some workings in that regard. The state, in our view, is not aligned right now to the industrial requirements for gas energy, availability and cost efficiency, and I'm saying that on the back of the recent announcements of putting LNG in the port of Kucha. Um, we're also sitting or having the risk of having a dispersed uh, demand profile for gas uh, because on the one hand you have the state that demands gas through their, through their energy policy, you have industry also demanding gas, but we're also suffering from scale in South Africa and we have to be very careful in terms of how we manage the uh, demand um, in order to bank projects feasibly going forward. Emission standards, we're all aware of what's happening there and uh, the reality today is that we're out of time and the stakes are high. The gas situation at present is moving on to the risk registers of our industrial gas users um, locally and abroad. So how do we establish this viable gas economy? It's the gas game and the infrastructure investment side around that is only a numbers game. And the best we can do in South Africa now is to sit around a table and aggregate numbers as deeply as we can, and certainly as we can. So the state has to consider the best manner in order to build this scale uh, for us to bank feasible infrastructure projects, which is desperately needed in the South African space. So the state needs to be the catalyst for these things rather than the controller, we believe. And um, we've called for the urgent establishment of the platforms in order to engage bilaterally on, on the situation. So with these thoughts in mind, um, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate your attention. And um, yeah, we look forward to the next part of the conversation. Thank you.